I've been on both sides of the table for this. So hiring manager at a number of different companies uh, for a number of different roles. And obviously I've also applied for jobs and promotions and gotten raises and had to negotiate for those things, both on my own behalf and as a manager on the behalf of people on my teams. So it's a little bit about my experience here. And we're going to talk both about kind of how to negotiate, why to negotiate, but also specific negotiation techniques so you don't have to feel like you're fighting over a small amount of resources with the person you're negotiating with. So it can be more of a <coughs> collaborative process. So first, how many people here have had a situation where you walked away and you were like, man, I really wish I had negotiated, but you didn't? Okay, raising my hand too. It's awkward. Um, it feels bad. It's very easy to not understand how to approach it in a way that feels friendly. And a lot of times you're in a situation where you want to be having building a relationship with someone. And so you don't want to start, like a new hiring manager that you're going to work with, you don't want to start with some kind of confrontation with them. So that's unpleasant. You want to avoid that. And it's also hard to feel like you negotiate well, because how many chances do most people have to negotiate? Like you only get a new job so many times. You only buy a car so many times. Whatever the situations are in your life where that comes up, probably the person across the table from you a recruiter, an HR professional, has more experience than you do doing that. You know that. And that makes it feel risky, too. Um, I think a lot of people spend time worrying that they will have an offer rescinded if they negotiate. So that's another reason I think people can avoid it sometimes. Um, it's also really easy to undervalue yourself, not understand what you should be asking for. And in that lack of information, it's easy to say, well, they know what they're doing. They made this offer to me. They liked me enough that they're hiring me or that they hired me already and they're promoting me. I feel good about it. It is more money. And so you just kind of walk away. And sometimes that works. And sometimes there wasn't more money on the table. Sometimes there are things that aren't money that you can negotiate for, though, that you also maybe gave up. So this is what can happen if you don't negotiate. The specific statistic is about women, but there's absolutely no reason that this would not affect people of all genders. Um, basically, you know, your starting salary when you first are starting out ends up being the basis for subsequent raises as you move to a new job, though increasingly it's not legal everywhere for them to ask this. You always get asked, how much do you make? Anytime you get a bonus, it's almost always going to be some kind of percentage on your salary. So the lifetime repercussions of not negotiating on the financial side can be quite large. And so one of the things I want to do in this talk today is get you to a point where you don't look back ready to retire half a million dollars shy of where you could have been. I'm going to talk a little bit about the things that can hold us back from feeling like we're going to be good negotiators. I think a huge one is imposter syndrome. How many people here are familiar with what that is? All right, so I'll be brief for the, for the folks in the room who aren't familiar with it. It's basically the sense that you're a fraud, that you somehow tricked someone into giving you the job that you have, that you don't really deserve it. And those feelings obviously make it very difficult to feel like you can make an accurate assessment of your worth, both in sort of monetary terms, but also when you're negotiating for a title, say, if you feel like man, I'm already underqualified for what I'm doing. It's very difficult to then say, I'm going to ask for more. Like Some people can, can get over that for themselves, but you often need to put conscious effort into making that happen. So imposter syndrome can be part of that. If you are a member of an underrepresented group in technology, there's something called stereotype threat that can also enter into it. How many people are familiar with stereotype threat? OK. Still lots. You guys are very well educated. But stereotype threat is essentially the feeling that if I make a mistake as a woman, you're going to say,
man, she's a crappy presenter. No, you're going to say women are bad presenters. Whereas if there's a cis man up here, chances are more that you'd say, oh, that dude, he sucked. So knowing that can make it very difficult to negotiate and advocate for yourself because it feels like <coughs> any misstep that you make doesn't even reflect badly just on you, but it plays into this stereotype of whatever underrepresented group you are part of, and that can make you hesitant to take risks. So this is all also often a factor, and it's one of the reasons, compounding many other systemic reasons, that women and other underrepresented minorities in technology tend to make less money over the course of their careers. Again, going back to that sort of compounding effect of not asking for more. So when is a good time to negotiate? There are plenty of super obvious times, right? So if someone makes a job offer, and that's going to be the moment where you're going to negotiate. So my speaker notes and disappeared. So the first job. Um, there are also subsequent jobs. How many people here are looking so either for a new job or looking to make a career change? OK, so you're going to have those natural negotiation points coming up pretty soon. Uh, another sort of natural moment is after like a positive performance review at your current job or maybe the conclusion of a big project. Anyone here planning to ask for a raise or a promotion in the next few months? A couple people? <laughs> I won't tell your boss, sorry. <laughs> um, so that's another natural point where you're going to have to negotiate. It can be difficult at an existing job to find those moments if you don't have a regular cadence of performance evaluations and salary adjustments. Um, the advice I would give you is that you can create those moments for yourself. So have a conversation with your supervisor and say, basically, want to go over what I've been doing, get some feedback from you. Hopefully your manager already does one-on-ones with you on a regular basis and you get that feedback. But either way, have a conversation with them, explicitly ask for feedback. And at the end of it, you want to say something along the lines of, so really appreciate it. Appreciate the feedback. Here are the things I'm going to work on. You know, at the end of May, I'll have been here for four years, and I think I want to talk to you, you know, in another few weeks about maybe, you know, a promotion or a salary adjustment or whatever is right for the situation that you're in. This does two things. It helps, so like I said, I've been on both sides of this conversation. It helps your boss be mentally prepared for the fact that they're going to have that conversation with you, so it's better not to spring it on them. But also, it gives them a chance if you're going to ask for something that requires something external to your boss. So budget, if you're going to ask for a raise, HR, or HR approval, if you're going to ask for a promotion. It gives your boss a chance to investigate those things so they can have a conversation with you that's based on an understanding of uh, what they can actually deliver rather than having to go back and have more back and forth. So you have that, it also sets you up so that in three, four weeks, when you say to your boss, hey, I just dropped a one-on-one -on, -one on your calendar so we can have that follow-up conversation, it kind of smooths the way for you to have the negotiation. You've kind of preset the stage so that that's ready. So that's my piece of advice on getting that set up. So let's play this forward. Yay, success, you have the conversation. You get the raise, you get the promotion, you get the job offer, it's very exciting. Now what? So there's this moment, at least for me, and I think it's true for a lot of people, where there's a moment of elation in the fireworks, and then there's kind of an oh shit moment. It's like now I'm gonna have to have this conversation that's gonna be uncomfortable and I don't want to have it, and I don't know how to approach it, and what am I going to do? So hopefully I've convinced you not to just say yes or just say no, um, but to enter into it with a spirit, a spirit of negotiation and give and take. It shouldn't be adversarial. Ideally, the conversation you're going to have is one where you're going to collaborate with the person who knows what resources from the pool of resources that exist in the universe are available for this specific conversation. And the two of you are gonna come up with something 
that is kind of a best case scenario for both parties. If you enter into it thinking that they're just going to drag their feet on everything, it kind of sets things up for what will probably be an unpleasant conversation. So some of it's mindset, some of it is preparation. So for women in particular, you may have seen studies talking about uh, the negative repercussions of negotiating. So there's been some good research done that there's a reputational hit for women who negotiate. So the dudes in the room, you don't need to worry about this. You can negotiate without people thinking any less of you. For women, that is less true. And I would, my advice would be to work hard to build relationships to overcome whatever hit that is. Because the financial impact of not negotiating is really long lasting. And there haven't been any long term studies on that reputational hit that we take by negotiating. And personally, it's been incredibly worthwhile for me. So I said in the intro that I've uh, been in you know, both sides as a candidate and then someone see seeking promotions and raises. I've had both successful and unsuccessful experiences. But I can tell you that I had an experience where I more than doubled my salary over about two years. It was like two years and two months. So yeah, so it sounds good. Um, the downside is if you want to make that happen, you need to start out like really, really dramatically underpaid. So <laughs> you know, you do the math. But basically, um, in my case, I had been out of the workforce for about five years, came back in, and when I got the job offer, it was lower than five years previous what my job had paid. And I was like, ooh, ouch. I'm not sure I want to take that. I talked to the hiring manager. And it was a startup. And he was like, look, this is basically what we can do. And you know, you haven't worked for five years. It's a technology job. It's hard to tell how sharp you are. And I was like, look, I'm going to rock this thing. So instead of in a year, we'll do an annual review. Let's say in six months, let's do a review. And if I'm delivering the way you'd expect, we're going to adjust my salary upwards. And yes, I waited about five months, and I had a conversation similar to what I described earlier. And I said, hey, you know, like I think I'm doing pretty well. You got feedback for me. Let me know what it is. And then three weeks later, we had a salary conversation. I got a raise. It was nice. It wasn't huge. It wasn't what I wanted to be making. It was just more than I had been making before. So you know, I kept working, turning along, more responsibilities, been there for a year have another conversation that's very similar. Except I'm like, hey, I've been here for a whole year. Look at what I've accomplished. Ran through things, and I was like, I should get a raise and a promotion. And I did. And it was a startup, and we were acquired. That helped the salary situation a little bit. And then I had more responsibilities as a result of the acquisition. <laughs> Six months later, even though it had then only been 18 months, have a conversation again. My point is that all that research aside, I pushed, and I pushed, and I pushed. And I worked really hard to maintain good relationships. I'd like to think I'm a friendly, nice person. My coworkers seem to not hate working with me. So I focused on those things. And let the money thing be its own kind of island, where, yes, once in a while I had to have a conversation with my boss, where I was like, look, I know you were trying to get me pay equity with my colleagues, but I don't have it yet. And we need to keep going. So it is possible, it took a lot of work, and honestly, if I had been paid more at the outset and hadn't started out like really at the bottom of what was possible for this position, it wouldn't sound so dramatic when I talk about it. So you know, you can take the low job offer, it lets you talk about it later, I guess. <laughs> so yeah. We're going to do a little role playing. So I have an exercise. I haven't done this before, but I think this is a good size group to do it with. And we're going to get into pairs and take 10 minutes. And we're going to talk through a scenario. And then this is going to form the basis for kind of the entire rest of my talk, the way this goes. So it's a negotiation between a recruiter who's making an offer, one person will be the recruiter, and the candidate that they're trying to hire. The other person will be the candidate. Uh, please don't share your piece of paper with the person in the other role, so you'll have a description on there of what you're looking for. But basically, we're going to be negotiating 
sort of full package. There are eight different factors, very complicated. 10 minutes is gonna fly by. It's not gonna be enough time for you to totally feel like, oh, yeah, we have agreement on these things. But your goal is to have the conversation with the recruiter as the candidate. Your goal is to have a conversation with the recruiter and try and come up with something that you are happy to accept. And your goal as the recruiter is to try and come up with something that lets the company sort of make an offer that they're gonna be happy with, but still lets you hire this person. So I'm gonna pass out the descriptions here. One minute. I don't know how It should be every other. So if yours says recruiter in the upper right, you're the recruiter. If it says candidate, be the candidate. I'll start these. You guys each need a sheet. Everybody take a sheet. Everybody take a sheet. Yeah, so yours should say candidate and yours should say recruiter. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. they're organized. You just need to take the top off. All right, so get yourself into a pair and see what you can do. I'm going to start the timer now.
Yes. So I'm going to cover the question was basically what how do we start like how, what's a good way to get traction on negotiation. I will cover that. So first I want to wrap up with the score in here though. So did anyone get anything over 13,000? Added together. You guys are a team. The two of you are a team. Added together. You got what do you guys get? 13,200. No, that's a perfect score. Congratulations. <laughs> Man, I should have brought something as a prize. You get, you get. Let's check our math first. <laughs> did, did you share your scoring sheets with each other? Not till the end. That's fantastic. Well done. I've seen people. I've seen this in a classroom with about the same number of people, and we did have 30 minutes, and no one got full uh, negotiation points. So well played. Uh, did anyone get over 12,600? You guys did, right? is also extremely good, especially given this length of time. Did anyone get less than 6,000? 
if you're willing to cop to that. Did anybody not reach, who didn't, I know some people did, who didn't reach an agreement? It wasn't that time. <laughs> yeah. I, it's not a lot of time. I, I heard some really creative role playing though, so you should get some points for that. So here are a couple things about the way the scoring works. So obviously there are different amounts of points for the different categories when you look up there. Um, there are some things that both sides agree on. So the highest point value is the same result for both the recruiter and the candidate. How many people felt like they were able to identify that while they were in the negotiation? You could tell you had an aligned interest on certain items. So we're talking here, this is location and start date. Some folks saw that. Um, there are also areas where it truly is a zero sum where the recruiter wins and the candidate loses and that is just how it's gonna be. How many people felt those things while you were negotiating? Yeah, I mean, the, that's, and it's, it's kind of the obvious ones, right? It's salary and the signing bonus. So the remaining ones though are ones where value can be created. So yeah, there, there is someone who's sort of a winner and a loser, but the amount of points is in some cases vastly different for the recruiter and the candidate. So if you're able to identify those areas while you are having this back and forth, that is how you create value. And that is actually the secret to uh, value creating non-zero sum negotiation. So there's a kind of classic negotiation exercise that I didn't want to do it here because there's a, a trick. And if you hear someone else get the trick, it kind of spoils it for you. And so since we were all in one room, I think it would have been awkward. But basically the way it works, uh, the scenario is that there is a massive oil spill that can only be, or chemical spill that can only be cleaned up using a chemical that's derived from a specific kind of citrus fruit. And there's a very small amount of that citrus grown come to maturity every year, and there's just been a spill of this chemical. And so one group needs it for that. Unfortunately, there also is a serious medical condition that only can be cured by another chemical derived from this same fruit. And it destroys the fruit when you create the chemicals, both of them. And so they're competing interests. And you have the negotiation is some folks who are trying to you know, solve this chemical spill so it doesn't like kill the population of LA. And then the other thing is like some terrible illness that affects it afflicts pregnant women and their other group is trying to you know, save this large population of pregnant women and their as yet unborn babies. So that's the negotiation. And you go in and the trick to it is that it turns out the chemical is derived in one case from the flesh of the fruit and in the other case from the rind. And both parties know which part of the fruit that they need. But in a negotiation, your impulse is to not share information. It's to play your cards close, right? To not let people know what it is that you need because they might use that to their advantage. If you do that in that particular scenario, everybody dies. <laughs> it's real <laughs> bad. So the trick to it is being willing to be open enough with the person that you're negotiating with about what it is that you need. Because the instant one person says, oh, well, what I need is the rind. The other person's gonna be like, I don't care about the rind. You can have the rind for free. And at that point, the negotiation is very straightforward because there is no competing interest. So figuring out what the other side values, that is a lot of the point of the exercise that you all just did. It's to figure out that there are some things that matter a lot to the recruiter and don't really matter very much to the candidate and vice versa. Did anybody feel like they were able to identify some of those things in the ebb and flow? A little bit, yeah, you guys had to, to get a perfect score. Anybody else? Yeah. yeah like the start date. Well, so, <laughs> like you offer something low and they go even lower and you're like, awesome. Yeah, no, that, was one, that was one where you agree though. The start date, both of you won. If you want to start like right away, for whatever reason, you're like, next week is perfect. So you're good to go. Um, so what we're talking about here is the difference between distributive and integrative 
negotiation. So this is what people who study like the art and science of negotiation call these two. Distributive is zero sum. So there's a winner, there's a loser. This is like the salary component of what you just did. Um, there are fixed resources. So in that case, um, I forget what the point value ends up being for the, the total, but there's just a certain amount of points that are gonna be distributed on that one, no matter what. Uh, and so what you do in a negotiation is you claim value. If we go with a nice round number that I can actually remember, which is 100, and say it was 100 points, and that's all there is. So you, as a negotiator, are then trying to claim all 100 of those points. The other kind is integrative. And so in this case, both sides benefit. They may not benefit equally. So there are some clear win-wins in the scenario you just went through. Those are things like start date, where you want the exact same thing, your interests align. On the other hand, there are scenarios where, yeah, the candidate has to give a little bit, the recruiter gets a lot, and they're then able to counter with something where the recruiter gives a little bit on something they don't care as much about that really, really matters to the candidate. In this case, I think vacation time was one of the big ones. What you're doing when you do that is creating value. So if you look at, again, my 100 points, which I know isn't the actual number on there, um, if you look at it as 100 points, if you both just compromise and go with the middle option, it's possible to come up with a different option that gives you 120 or 140 points if you give in the right direction, where the person who cares more gets more of that thing. So that is the trick, such as it is, to creating value through negotiation and having both people win. So looking back at this with the actual values, um, the recruiter values the performance bonus and the title a lot more than the candidate does. The candidate really values vacation time and educational benefits. And I'm guessing for all of you, I see nods, when you were doing the negotiation, those were the things where you focused on point value and you were like, well, there are a couple big ticket ones, salary is one, and after that, you start getting to these other things. And it's like, well, how do we come up with a solution where we can both have our needs met? At least a little bit. So how do you do that? In a real world, actual negotiation, not this like eight faceted and prearranged thing. Preparation is the key. So there's a lot of research. Again, this one is about women, but I think it probably holds less dramatically for men as well. I haven't actually looked up the numbers. Ambiguity leads to leaving value on the table. Not sharing information is one aspect of ambiguity, but it's also, you know, you can do glass door. Um, I have somewhere a resource sheet that I put together for this. Um, that there are a bunch of places where you can look up salary information. You know, talk to people, there's all the kind of standard advice <coughs> about how to gather that. But having some sense of what the salary should be, and the more clear cut it is, the easier it is to come up with a fair uh, negotiated salary for both sides. Which is why I'm really heartened that I'm seeing more and more job posts that actually post their salary range. Because using real information is the best way to overcome this stuff, and it does help with salary discrimination. So preparation, knowing your numbers, doing that research. Research, yes, I see a question. Point values for candidates and recruiters posted online somewhere. So, just, uh, just uh, yeah, I just think, yeah, even though uh, it's uh, uh, going to be different for uh, every situation, of course, it just gives some idea on uh, uh, illustrates the give and take. Yes, so they are posted. Um, it's actually, so what I did is I modified an existing negotiation exercise for this presentation, so there's a version of it that's posted online. I'm gonna find some way to put my slides on SlideShare or something, so it'll be available. But this is actually, um, they're, I think it's out of Harvard, they have a series of negotiation exercises uh, that are not freely available, but if you take like an MBA negotiation class, which is where I first was exposed to these, uh, that's where like the ugly fruit um, the thing I described earlier with the citrus fruit is one of those exercises too. So 
I think the answer is, yeah, some of it is online, because this is a kind of classic exercise. This particular version is mine, because I made it up like at 10 o'clock last night. So I'll post my slides. Um, so as you prepare, understanding both, there's a uh, negotiation I call it reservation point. It's, I call it your walk away number. So this is the point where if the negotiator just will not go above a certain number, you don't need the job that bad and you're gonna walk away, whatever the negotiation is. So there's, there's some point that's a floor. You also wanna think through kind of what the average salary, this is the research on Glassdoor where we, you get that pay scale information. Um, and you also want to think about what your kind of ideal number is. Not like a crazy pie in the sky, but the number where if you leave that conversation and that's the number you get, you're going to pick up a bottle of champagne on the way home and you're going to pop that as soon as you walk in the door. So think about what that number is. You're not going to share maybe any of those numbers, um, although I would encourage you to think about sharing that ideal number as the what am I looking for in this job number. The next point is choose your timing. So there's a lot of kind of contradictory information about, particularly around salary, should you go first when you share numbers? So the recruiter is always immediately gonna pressure you, how much are you making, what are you looking for? Usually they'll just try and get you to share your current salary information. A lot of people don't wanna do that, and in many situations you don't. Um, how strictly you want to not do that kind of, I would say, know your situation. Uh, I do know people who literally will not do that and will walk away from an opportunity before they share that. I think that's a little short-sighted, but it's, I'd say, know your environment. There's also something to be said for going first and sharing a number. There's something called an anchor point, and if you go first, you have the opportunity to kind of set the tone for that whole conversation. So, and this can be, if you are changing careers and you know that your salary is probably going to take a hit, this might be a good time to say, well, currently, I'm making X. And let them deal with the fact that that might be higher than they're prepared to go. The other thing is to understand, how many people have heard of a BATNA? Okay, not many. Um, that is, the negotiators use it, it's the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And it goes back to what I was saying just a bit ago about your walk away number. So it's the walk away number is just the number, but what happens if you walk away? So if you're a candidate, maybe you stay at your current job. How bad is that? How much do you care about that? Maybe you have multiple job offers. Um, maybe you're unemployed and you're like, man, I just need to get this job tomorrow. That's why I want to start April 29th. Like, how soon can I start working? Um, it's also really important to think through what that alternative to reaching an agreement with you is for the person on the other side of the table. And I think job seekers in particular really fail to think about this. So a lot of times when you're negotiating a raise or a promotion, you're able to think through, well, what would they do without me? And it feels very much like you can have that conversation because you know that it's gonna be hard to replace you. You know what the hiring process is there. You know it's slow, you know it's costly. You know your boss freaking hates doing it. So. You have some sense there, but often as a job seeker, I think it's not clear how high the cost really is. Once they're at the point that they're making you an offer, it can be extremely costly for them to go back and need to rerun a search, screen more candidates, not have someone start as soon as, man, you want to start April 29th. They'd love to get you in the door, right? Um, really think through what the alternative is for the other person because that helps you understand what your negotiating position is. This next point also, anticipate reactions. So some of that is if you are a career changer or like I was in the situation I described earlier, you're coming back after some time off or maybe you're junior in your career. Think through what you're likely to hear uh, from someone pushing back on your, you know, they, they offered you some number, you said I want 10% more than that and they're like, yeah, you've been out of the workforce for five years. What do you want? Think through what you might hear so you can have a reaction already planned. So if they say that, I'm gonna say, well, but here's how I kept up my skills during those five years that I was out, or whatever. Just think through for your particular situation. Also, think about what 
compromise you might reach. So <laughs> if they push back, um, like in a negotiation scenario that you guys role played, it's possible to put together kind of packages of options. And it is better, you know, eight is a lot. We had eight in that scenario. But it is better to think through, here are three things or four things that go together and not try and negotiate things one at a time because it lets you do a better job of kind of expanding the number of uh, points, effectively, that are available. So for instance, rather than negotiating salary and then negotiating start date, if you negotiate them together, maybe with the educational bonus, which you know you care a lot about, that will let you put together a package of offerings that maybe meets both people's needs better. So think through how you're gonna put some of that stuff together. And think about what matters to you. So I had to come up with eight different things that were uh, relevant to a salary negotiation that weren't just salary and bonus. And then try and think about well, what would the recruiter care about and what would the candidate care about. Think about what you care about. It could be that this work from home thing, like the scenario I set up, apparently that person did not wanna work from home. Right? Like they were really keen to go to the office every day. But the opposite might be true for you. Or maybe you need a remote job. Um, maybe it's really important to you that you have uh, flexibility that one day a week you can always work from home on Fridays. Whatever your things are, think those things through so that you can uh, come, come up with those as you're having the conversation. Does anyone know how am I on time? I've lost my time. All right. So, what time am I supposed to be ending? 30 seconds or a minute. Awesome. All right, so, Zoom, uh, practice. Practice all the things we just talked about, all those responses. I would say do it as much as you can. My personal little tip there is to practice while you're exercising. If you are nervous about really anything that you need to practice, any kind of difficult conversation, when you're exercising, your heartbeat's already up, you're already breathing hard. If you're someone who's prone to panic attacks, it's very difficult to have a panic attack while you're exercising because you know why your heart rate is up, you know why you're breathing hard. And so that's a really good time to practice these kind of difficult conversations. Do whatever you need to do to psych yourself up. So listen to a good playlist, do some power poses in the shower before you drive to the the interview or the place where you're going to have this negotiation. And again, rehearse. So some of your practice, don't just rehearse the things that you think won't go well, you know, the pushback you're going to get. Rehearse having them make that ideal number offer to you. So you can also rehearse in your head what it feels like to really nail it. Because that helps too. All right, and I guess questions, we can do out in the hallway. So the next speaker can talk. Thank you very much.